Good afternoon, everyone. Bancroft Neuro Rehab welcomes you to our Heads Up webinar series. Today's program will focus on the effects of aging on individuals with traumatic brain injury. And now I will turn the presentation over to today's speaker, Diane Giorgetti, who is a member of the physical therapy team at Bancroft Neuro Rehab. Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Giorgetti, and I'm a physical therapist here at Bancroft. And I became interested in this topic of aging with a traumatic brain injury because many of the adult individuals that we see here at Bancroft were injured in early adulthood and are now aging. And some have been living with their traumatic brain injury for many years, even decades. So I become curious as to how aging is affecting their health and function. Do individuals with TBI age on the same trajectory as the general public or does aging accelerate the effects of TBI? And originally I had called this webinar the effects of aging on TBI, but I ended up changing that because I was, as I was researching it, it became clear that it really works both ways. Um, people with a history of TBI or having a history of TBI affects the aging process and aging impacts the deficits seen with the traumatic brain injury. And there's overlap. It's really difficult to tease them out and separate, separate them. So I changed that on into a with to sort of reflect that relationship. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. You can glance over the objectives. We'll be talking about the relationship between um, certain diseases associated with aging, some neurodegenerative changes, medical and physical changes, and lastly, some interventions. Traumatic brain injury is a leading cause of death and disability worldwide. And historically, uh, moderate to severe injuries did result in death, but over the generations, there's been advances, particularly in trauma care, especially during war times that have resulted in some dramatic improvements in survival rates. And now millions of individuals with mild, moderate, and even severe injury last for decades. So if you do survive the injury, then TBI becomes a, a cause of a long-term disability. It's estimated, and this number was sort of fluid. I saw anything from 1.7 to 2.5 million people are affected annually with TBI. That's just the United States and more than 5 million people currently are living in the United States with TBI. The most common demographic that traumatic brain injury affects are younger people ages 15 to 19, followed by ages 20 to 24, and then there's a gap, and then older people, um, mostly associated with falls, are that third demographic. So it becomes apparent that it's Important, and uh, this quote sort of sums it up, that developing a greater understanding of aging with brain injury is especially important as the highest incidence of brain injury remains among those in the adolescence or young adult years, and these individuals are likely to live half a century with their injury. So traumatic brain injury originally has, was thought to be kind of a static neurological insult. There was the primary injury, the trauma, the gunshot wound, the bullet happened, and then it was over. But it's now known that it, it's more of a chronic disorder. It gives rise to a secondary injury, which can be described as a cascade of events leading to changes on a cellular level, a molecular level. And then these things can trigger progressive neurodegeneration and dementia. And this can go on and on, leading to long standing effects. Things that happen on that cellular level are cellular swelling, changes in membrane gradients, that there's a dysfunction in the blood-brain barrier, influx of immune and inflammatory mediators, and exocytotoxic transmitter release. And we'll be talking about some of these things a little bit more. Now, we know that there are changes that occur in the general public with aging in the brain, you know, without a TBI. Things like changes in brain size, the brain does shrink, changes in blood supply, altered neuronal connections and networks. And all these things together can lead to progressive decline of functional capabilities and a decline in cognitive abilities. So let's focus on cognition. Researchers have studied the effects of TBI on cognition in early and mid adulthood. And it's clear that at that stage, um, the initial injury impairments in cognition occur and we've all seen this things like executive functioning attention um, working memory um, concentration initiation however 
looking at studies with people with a remote or lifetime TBI, there has not really been as much research on that and how it is associated with dementia. Although this is important because in studies with participants who were five to 10 years post-injury, the predominant factors relating to disability weren't the physical things, it was the cognition, the behavior, and personality changes. There's really limited knowledge on how TBI sustained during early adulthood or mid-adulthood mid will influence changing. So let's talk about some of the neurodegenerative and neurophysiological changes seen in normal adult, in normal adult aging as well as aging with the TBI. So first of all, changes in brain structure. With normal aging, there is some amount of naturally occurring atrophy of cerebral tissue. The brain shrinks lesser volume. And this, tish, this tissue loss is associated with injury severity in TBI and poor recovery. In traumatic brain injury, we also see some ventricular enlargement and some sulcal prominence. These things are also linked with cognitive decline. Remyelination. You know, myelin is that uh, sheath that forms around the axons, the nerve fibers in the brain, and it increases the speed and efficiency at which impulses can be conducted. And remyelination is an ongoing process in the healthy brain. However, with normal aging, we do see that this becomes less efficient, and this then can affect the transmission and the connectivity of the impulses. And we also see this in traumatic, traumatic brain injury. It's also associated with a decreased remyelination, remyelination capacity. And this can lead to cognitive impairment, which makes sense if you're getting slower or less efficient connectivity and signals in the brain. The hippocampus, the hippocampus is part of the limbic system in the brain. And some of its jobs are forming new memories and it's also associated with learning and emotions. And a large volume in healthy adults appears to protect against dementia, a larger volume hippocampus. And with normal aging, we do see hippocampal shrinking starting at around age 60 to 70. And it has been shown that the hippocampus also is frequently impacted with traumatic brain injuries. Hormonal changes. Both normal aging and traumatic brain injury have been associated with hormonal changes. And this can also play a role in cognitive decline. So for example, the thyroid and growth hormones both decrease in normal aging and they're also found to be deficient in traumatic brain injury. And these hormones are important because they are associated with oligodendrogenesis, which is producing oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are support cells in the CNS and they make the myelin. So they are uh, responsible for that remyelination. So obviously, if these hormones are lacking, we will not be getting that remyelination, which can again affect that connectivity and transmission of signals in the brain. It's not clearly understood how TBI-related and age-related neuroendocrine changes interact. Changes in immunological regulation. So what we're talking about here is inflammation. So we know that inflammation is a good thing. It is something that happens normally as a result for, to infection or injury or some insult. It facilitates the healing process. And this acute inflammation lasts anywhere from a few hours to days. But it's when it becomes into a chronic stage that this becomes a bad thing. It can linger. And what happens is it just leaves your body in this constant state of alert. And anything, any insult then to your body kind of results in this over inflammatory response. And that can lead to things like tissue loss, edema, and then on to decreased connectivity within the brain, progressive structural changes, and some long-term functional deficits. Microglial cells are implicated here. They are the macrophages of the CNS. Macrophages are specialized cells that destroy bacteria or other harmful organisms. They kind of initiate this inflammation stage. And they live long and they're vulnerable to aging. And there's a phenomenon that happens called microglial priming. And this is when the microglial become more sensitive, kind of almost hyperactive. So that, as I said, they become sensitive to any little uh, insult that happens after the initial traumatic brain injury. And they can cause this 
overreaction and then leave you in a state of chronic inflammation, which can then have ill effects. And this is called microglial priming. Upregulation refers to just increased firing of neurons and um, neurotransmitters. And these micro, uh, microglial priming and upregulation both are seen to occur in traumatic brain injury. And this increased immune activity can be seen for years after the initial injury. I mentioned before uh, the brain blood, blood barrier, which is a selective barrier to the brain that blocks the entry of some pathogens and immune cells. But this process, this microglial priming can also disrupt the blood brain barrier. And then that can cause intracranial pressure, um, cell death, and then of course lead to cognitive impairment also. We also see with normal aging, sometimes an increase in amyloid plaques neurofibrillary tangles and Lewy bodies. Let me jump to the next slide for a minute. So Lewy bodies are made up of a protein called alpha-synuclein. And that is a protein that is found in healthy adults. It does have some functions. It's found on the presynaptic terminals of the neurons and it's involved in neurotransmitter release. But when it clumps, it becomes what's called Lewy bodies. And that has been shown to interfere with functioning of the neurons, and it's associated with dementia and Parkinson's disease. Amyloid plaques are groups of misfolded proteins that form in the spaces between nerve cells. And that has been shown to play a central role in Alzheimer's disease. Tau protein is also something that is present in healthy brains and its primary job is to work in maintaining the stability of the microtubules in the axons. Microtubules are involved in cell division and also just the shape and structure of the cell, maintaining that. So tau protein is good, but if that gets clumped or into these neurofibrillary tangles, that has been shown to be a primary marker for Alzheimer's disease. Both of all of these things can be seen in normal aging, but then they're precursors to these neurodegenerative diseases. And with brain injury, a buildup of amyloid beta and tau can be neurotoxic, contributing to nor neuronal loss, and it can drive neurodegeneration and associated brain atrophy. And it can be even after a single injury, and it can lead to damaged, damaged axons. White matter deterioration. So white matter is referring to the axons. So again, anything um, impacting the axons is going to decrease the efficiency of connectivity. And this, uh, this is seen with normal aging and it can be associated with dementia, but we do have some redundancy in our system and that gives us some protection. So if a damaged, if a damaged primary pathway is damaged, it can be replaced by redundant pathways and that enables function to be retained but it is thought that these redundant pathways are not as functionally effective as the originals. So therefore it can make our brain vulnerable to cognitive impairment as we age. And TBI has also been shown to cause white matter abnormalities. So with aging and a TBI, it just seems like that would exacerbate this decreased connectivity leading to possibly accelerated cognitive decline. So these, these things have made researchers question whether or not individuals with a traumatic brain injury are at a higher risk for getting diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease, maybe younger or faster. So let's look at some of the research. One study looked at the association between traumatic brain injury and late, late life neurodegenerative conditions and neuropathological findings. And this study looked at whether or not traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness greater than one hour was associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and other dementias. And it was a, a large prospective cohort study and it looked at three prospective studies. And so the sample size was large, it was over 7,000 older adults 865 with TBI with loss of consciousness, and 589 of the total sample came to autopsy. And they determined the Parkinson's diagnosis using the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, 
and they used the National Institute of Neurologic and Communicative Diseases and Stroke slash Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disease Association criteria to determine an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And cognitively, subjects were screened with a cognitive ability screening instrument and also a battery of neuropsych tests. And the results were that there was no statistically significant relationship between TBI with loss of consciousness and a risk of dementia. Kind of surprising. There was no associating association between traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness and Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. And that's just defined as co cognitive impairment beyond what you would normally expect with normal aging, but it's not affecting you functionally yet. It's kind of a transitional stage. TBI with loss of consciousness was associated with progression of Parkinsonian features and a risk for incident Parkinson's disease. Neuropathologic findings at autopsy were that traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness was associated with Lewy body accumulation, cerebral microinfarcts, and hippocampal sclerosis. TBI with loss of consciousness less than an hour was associated, was also associated with Lewy body accumulation, but there is no association with TBI with loss of consciousness and neurofibrillary degeneration or the neurotic plaques, which were the, what was more associated with Alzheimer's. Another study looked at understanding neurodegeneration after TBI. It also was a, was a meta-analysis combining the results of multiple studies. So it was a very large sample of greater than 2 million people. And the results here were that there was a 1.6 times increase of dementia after head injury, the range being from 1.18 to 1.8, depending on different factors like age of, sever um, age of injury or severity of injury. This study was inconclusive regarding the Alzheimer's disease risk, but it was conclusive in that the Parkinson's disease risk was increased even after a single TBI. Another study looked at the neuropsychological profile of lifetime traumatic brain injury in older veterans, sample size of 169, mean age 79, 88 with a TBI, 81 without. Cognition was assessed using, again, a, a battery of neuropsychological testing, and they looked at five domains being attention slash working memory, learning slash memory, language, processing speed, and executive functioning. And it was found that older veterans with a remote history of TBI showed greater deficits in processing speed and executive function. The other domains were similar to veterans without TBI. And these results held true whether or not it was a multiple, a multiple mild TBIs or just one moderate to severe injury. One more study looked at subjective and objective cognitive function among older adults with a history of TBI. And this study looked at the cognitive profile of community dwelling older adults that did not have any dementia diagnosis. Sample study again was pretty large, 984. The age was 51 or older. 237 had a prior TBI and they were all really remote from their TBIs. 38 years was the mean. Participants with TBI did not perform significantly differently from respondents without TBI on any measure of cognitive function. However, they didn't look at executive functioning or processing speed. And those are the very things that were implicated on the previous study. They did find that participants with TBI did subjectively report memory impairment, even when there wasn't any difference in their objective measures. They found that after TBI with loss of consciousness, there's a 38% increased risk for subjective memory impairment, and that was partially linked to depression. So what do we make of this? The results are kind of mixed. Um, and the studies have limita limitations. For instance, some are comparing groups that all have dementia or all, uh, or all don't have dementia. There's not a good control. Um, some of the studies looked at predisposing factors or comorbidities. They ruled out certain medical or psych psychiatric issues. Some didn't. 
Some identify the ages, like what is an older adult? Some, as that one study said, it was 51 and older. Some were looking more at like 65 and older. The lack of postmortem data, one of the studies I talked about had some, but not all of them. And also the reliance on self-reporting. Um, for instance, the one study about loss of consciousness, um, some of the studies that were looked at in that group use medical records to determine loss of consciousness. And some simply just ask the people, you know, do, do you remember losing your consciousness? So just a lot of inconsistencies with the research, as well as the fact that, as we know, every single traumatic brain injury is, is different. So kind of a, a take home from all this, I like this one quote from this one researcher. She summed it up by saying, the data support the suggestion that pathological changes triggered by an earlier traumatic brain injury will have an influence on normal aging processes and will interact with neurodegenerative disease processes rather than the development of a specific disease such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. And chronic neurophysiological change after TBI may have detrimental effects on neurodegenerative disease. So let's shift gears from it here and talk about some medical and functional changes. So we know that with normal aging, there are some health issues that emerge later in life and included in these are cognitive impairments. And many of these same changes are also seen with chronic traumatic brain injury, both physical changes and cognitive changes. And I mentioned before that cognitive changes were closely linked or, or more highly linked with disability than the physical changes but level, level of mobility does appear to be an important contributor in life expectancy. So first let's look at some neurologic problems. Chronic pain. Pain can always be difficult to manage, but over time it becomes even more difficult. The causes from an injury can be certainly just the injury itself, the physical trauma, um, whatever mus musculoskeletal or soft tissue issues occurred, but there's also later complications that can cause pain, dysautonomia, neuropathy, spasticity, heterotopic ossification, complex regional pain syndrome, tendinitis, and just the soft tissue imbalances that can occur. If you can just picture in your mind, maybe a, an individual that you've worked with who has a hemiplegia, say, so the way that they sit or the way that they walk, they have some gait impairments, some compensation. So um, they're weight bearing more on one side or their stronger side is just getting overused and weak or their shorter side, is, their weaker side is having some um, muscle shortening or muscle lengthening and just the overuse on the joints or the, the misuse on the joints, all that can, it's not a surprise that that can really lead to some pain and put aging on top of that, and that's just going to get worse. Headaches are very common, post-traumatic brain injury. And pain can increase the risk for many things. It can increase depression, sleep disturbances, and just an overall poor functional outcome. Seizures. Seizures are very common after traumatic brain injury initially, and sometimes they go away and they don't come back, but they can be persistent and they can occur later on in the injury and increase in severity and become really hard to manage over time. Sometimes in older adults, we do see um, seizures emerging after the initial injury, as I said, later, later on, and they can increase the risk for depression, sleep disturbances, cognitive decline. And part of the problem also is that long-term use of some of the meds to treat them can also then have detrimental effects when they're being used over a period of time. Tone and spasticity. Tone is not, increased tone is not something that you'll see in normal healthy adults, but with traumatic brain injury, it's very common and it can worsen over time. But even if it doesn't worsen over time, if it just stays the same, it can really affect a lot of issues such as posture, balance, um, the way that you're walking and therefore your functional mobility. Musculoskeletal issues such as physical trauma, for instance, just the fractures that or the uh, soft tissue damage that occurred at the accident, they could be well managed at the time, but then later on they can reemerge. They can just cause a chronic weakness or 
something can be refractured. And then osteoporosis. That is common, as we know, in older adults due to the lack of bone density. And this can also occur prematurely after brain injury related to the decreased weight bearing if someone's not ambulatory or just not walking as much. There's some metabolic and endocrine changes also similar between aging and traumatic brain injury, weight gain. We do know that it's not uncommon for older adults to slowly gain weight over time. And it's also common for patients with traumatic brain injury to gain weight. And this can be just related to their inactivity. If they're not as active as they were, not able to move around as much on their own, it can be medications that affect weight. It can simply be eating too much and they have a lack of that self-monitoring or self-discipline or also just apathy, not caring whether they're gaining weight or not. But this can have a lot of significant problems such as risk for different diseases, cardiovascular disease. It can affect skin integrity and affect mobility. Metabolic syndrome, this is a really serious condition, which is a combination of medical disorders that increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, it can lead to death. It's suspected that 40% of the general public, healthy adults or seemingly healthy adults over the age of 60 have metabolic syndrome. And it's also been shown to have an increased incidence post-traumatic brain injury. Characteristics include hypertension, insulin resistance, abdominal obesity, and dyslipidemia. Risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, smoking, physical inactivity, obesity, stress, and prolonged use of antipsychotic meds. Metabolic syndrome can put someone at a higher risk for heart attack, retinopathies, chronic kidney disease, peripheral arterial disease, and stroke. Swallowing and GI issues. With normal aging, there actually is an increase in dysphagia in the general public, about 13 to 32% of adults 65 and older do have dysphagia. And as we know, with individuals, individuals with traumatic brain injury, we also see this commonly. And it can be persistent and worsen with age. It can be impacted by things like that weight gain, poor positioning, poor posture, fatigue, poor dental and oral health. And impairments with swallowing can lead to serious issues like malnutrition, dehydration, choking, and aspiration pneumonia. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is also commonly seen more with older adults and also with traumatic brain injury. Urinary incontinence, a problem sometimes with normal aging and definitely can be a problem post-traumatic brain injury. And the physical, physical disabilities and cognitive impairment can both add to this. If you think about it, you need to be able to get to the bathroom on time. Can you um, plan ahead as far as if you were going somewhere and maybe go to the bathroom before you leave or make sure that you can locate the bathroom of where you're going to be, don't drink too much, things like that, you know, as well as the physical aspect of getting to the bathroom on time. And incontinence can lead to skin problems, deep venous thrombosis, pressure sores, slow healing wounds. These can all be a result of things like not moving around enough, weight gain, incontinence. And these things can be seen with aging and with traumatic brain injury. Sleep disturbances, common complaint with the elderly and also a common complaint after brain injury. Things like post-traumatic hypersomnia, sleeping too much, fatigue, excessive daytime sleepiness, difficulty falling and or staying asleep, restless sleep, early waking, feeling unrested even if you're getting sleep, sleep apneas, chronic obstructive or, or central sleep apnea, um, sleep walking. And these things can lead to 
know, behavior instability can affect your cognition, it can affect your socialization, your overall health. Age is correlated, as I said, but also things like brainstem alterations, changes in neurotransmitters, um, alternate activity pattern, boredom, depression, all these things that come into play sometimes with traumatic brain injury can all lead to these sleep disturbances. And falls. We know the elderly have about a 30, I think over 65, um, a 30% chance, more increased chance of falling. And to anybody who's worked with patients who are aging with their traumatic brain injury, we know we've seen an increase of falls and sometimes that's balance. It can also be a factor of behavior, impulsivity, um, impaired, sense, impaired senses like vision and hearing, attention, judgment, all these things can lead to frequent falls. So with all these issues, as one ages with a traumatic brain injury, what is quality of life? So a couple of studies I looked at, one compared older adults ages 50 to 65, post mild traumatic brain injury, and older adults post orthopedic injury, and it was found that the mild traumatic brain injury group experienced more role losses, had lower quality of life, and were less satisfied with their daily activity performance. Another study looked at 11 articles, and they looked at community integration of older adults post-traumatic brain injury, and they were compared to younger adults post-traumatic brain injury. And the study indicated that older adults have less success with community integration as compared to younger adults. And it particularly highlighted the emphasis on social integration, stating that social integration and quality of life should be primary rehab goals. Another study looked at evidence in regards to the need for environmental enrichment, exercise, and social engagement to delay age-related cognitive decline. And it particularly focused on the social engagement piece, and it showed that social engagement preserved that hippocampal function, kept that hippocampus from shrinking as much, therefore leading to decrease in the cognitive decline. So what can be done? Well, medical research is focusing on some treatments. Um, there's been treatments aimed at enhancing um, the protection of the neuroinflammatory, I'm sorry, enhancing the protection of the brain and the, trying to decrease the effects of neuroinflammation, decreasing those detrimental effects that lead to the swelling, lead to the brain cell death. A couple of drugs that are being looked at are, one's called myocycline, and this has been shown to have some anti-inflammatory effects and to keep the brain, blood brain barrier more intact at least in animal studies. So they still need to do human studies on that. And there's another drug, melatonin, which is shown to have neuroprotective properties and inhibit some of that microphage activity. Again, they're just not sure of the long-term effects on that, so further research is needed. And also statins have been shown to have some neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory effects. So as far as pharmaceutical intervention, those are some things that are being looked at. There's also research looking into the development of use of functional MRI to identify certain biomarkers that are associated with accelerated aging in TBI. So more research needs to be done as far as those type of interventions. But then there's also things that we as rehab professionals can also just do to support healthy aging and increase quality of life with this demographic. So multidisciplinary rehabilitation has been shown in research that it is helpful, which is good. That's what we all do. And not only initially, but also ongoing. People go through their acute rehab and then they move on to either back to their life activities or into different um, other rehab outpatient or things. But it's been shown that ongoing rehab is definitely needed. 
or older adults with traumatic brain injury may start falling, may start having changes in their status, whether it be cognitive status or physical status, spasticity changes, um, they become more depressed, things like that. They need to be able to be plugged into rehab on an ongoing basis as they age. Pharmaceutical management. Meds need to be tweaked and looked at carefully. As people age, they may gain or lose weight, so the meds will have different effects. Um, they may have more susceptibility to the side effects as they age. Um, some medications aren't made to be used long term. So it's important to look at pharmaceutical management on an ongoing basis and not have them be on too many drugs that might be interacting. I think a lot of our patients are on a very long laundry list of drugs. So it's important to have this tweaked and looked at frequently on an ongoing basis. Now, many of the rest of the things I'm going to be talking about are really just healthy aging for the general public as well as individuals with traumatic brain injury. Good sleep hygiene, things like being on a schedule, going to bed and waking up at the same time, not having screen time before bedtime, sleeping in a dark room, a quiet room, um, temperature controlled, avoiding large meals or caffeine before bedtime. They can all be used to try to combat that sleep disturbance. Maintaining a healthy weight. So many advantages to not being overweight or underweight. Avoiding diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, skin problems, that metabolic syndrome I was talking about. Just being able to maintain your mobility if you have some weakness and impaired balance, things like that because of your injury, you may not be able to stand up as easily or walk as easily. If you add poundage to that, it's only going to make it more difficult. Or if you are dependent on someone else to move you around, it's only going to make transferring you and managing you that much harder also, which can then lead to skin issues and other things. So maintaining a healthy body weight is really important. Good nutrition kind of just dovetails in with maintaining a healthy weight. Having a stable activity pattern, a routine, things to do, meaningful things to do, not just marking time, um, but actually having things that are enjoyable and, and mean something. Cognitive and educational pursuits. The more that you challenge the brain, it's been shown to stimulate new neuronal connections, new learning, neuroplasticity, and social engagement. As I mentioned, it does help protect the hippocampus from shrinking and prevent cognitive decline, but we know there's challenges to social engagement. It's things like just finding the right, the right group for our individuals with traumatic brain injury. Um, behaviorally, cognitively, will they be able to fit into some group or social, social situation? Transportation, just getting them there, funding, all these things can be barriers to social engagement. Exercise, I'm a physical therapist, so I have to spend a few extra minutes talking about the benefits of exercise. We know that this can help many things. It can help control weight. It can help with that activity pattern we talked about. Let me just briefly give you a couple studies. One study looked at the benefits of exercise maintenance after traumatic brain injury, and participants, that participants were assessed at baseline using the Beck Depression Inventory after a 10-week intervention and also at six month follow up, the exercise intervention involved one 60 minute supervised session and four 30 minute unsupervised sessions. And their depression scores were reduced and they were maintained over time. And participants reported a higher perceived quality of life and mental health. Another study looked at the neuroprotective effects of physical exercise on adult neurogenesis. And this was looking at just adults in gen the general public, not specifically traumatic brain injury. And it was shown that regular exercise in old age is able to enhance hippocampal volume. There's that hippocampus again. And exercise improves neurogenesis and learning in aged mice. I'll mention this study was actually also a big kind of meta-analysis. So it looked at studies that involved humans and animals. And exercise was found to lower the amount of age-dependent brain atrophy. And regular physical activity was related to a reduced risk of developing 
Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, exercise can increase social engagement, whether you're getting out to a group or just exercising with a couple people. And it can add to that stable activity pattern, giving you something to do, whether or not you are leaving the house to go exercise or just having it as part of your daily routine. Both of those things, as I said, can improve cognition. Exercise can also improve balance. It can improve strength, cardiovascular health, and improve your mood. So getting our older adults with traumatic brain injury exercising is really important. Okay, this ends my talk. I hope that you learned something and have found it interesting. Thank you. On behalf of Bancroft Neural Rehab, I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes our program. Have a great day.